So I'm Meg Riley with the Church of the Larger Fellowship. I was really delighted that Susan Newman Moore from All Souls Church in Washington, D.C. reached out to co-sponsor a gathering today. I think we've all been feeling overwhelmed and numb, and it's really easy to feel alone with these international and national and for some of us, very local tragedies that are going on. So I think that the antidote to that kind of hopelessness begins with coming together in community. And this is a community I'm very grateful to come together with. We'll have people from all over the country speaking. Just want to lift up that Black Lives of UU, who have been a very strong and important group within us, are not speaking here today. They are tending to other things uh, locally and nationally. And I know that uh, Carlton Elliott Smith last night had a gathering um, for black folks. Um, so we will, I'm happy to say Amanda Weatherspoon will be joining the CLF staff next week. And part of her mission will really be gathering black folks together. Sadly, we plan it as, in as a position because there are just so many of these times that we've needed in the last few years. Um, we're going to start with a chalice lighting. And um, during that time, if you say where you are, say the chalice, wherever you are, we'll get to see in the chat. You can see down at the bottom, there's something called chat. If you click on that. And actually, just so you know, this is, you can have that on the side. You can also move that wherever you want to. But um, that is a way that you can, also, if you want to um, you see, you can do pop out and then you can move it around. But um, that's also a way you can talk privately to someone if you want to, or you can speak to the group. But when we do the chalice lighting, I would love it if everybody, wherever you are, says the chalice is lit. And so I will just start to say that we come together for a moment out of time in a place made holy by our presence to grieve and to rage and to feel numb and to feel everything authentically that we feel at this time that it is good to be together and that the chalice is lit so we can now all as we listen to this is going to be a the first song is a long kind of grounding song i really invite you to just deepen into it close your eyes turn off your screen if you turn off your camera if you want to and really use it as a time of quiet prayer Thank you. That was lovely. Uh, my name is Rob Keith, and I'm a community minister affiliated with All Souls Church in Washington, D.C. And as I reflected on the day's events before I even knew this gathering was going to be happening, the phrase isolated incident kept coming into my brain um, from reading conversations on Facebook and other places. And and it just struck me on uh, a very whole body level that in, in this case and, and perhaps in life generally, um, there is simply no such thing as an isolated incident, that especially on issues of race and violence in this country, everything is connected and all people are connected. And it's not, Nothing, nothing that has happened is an isolated incident, but what has happened, what will happen in the future is because of isolation. Isolation from each other, isolation from the common humanity that, that binds us all. And so for me, opportunities to come together in person and online are both a symbolic and a spiritual rejection of isolation and a recognition that we are so deeply connected to each other and to every single thing that happens in this world. Um, and especially, especially at this time, it's important to be together and to feel that connection and to know that whatever happens going forward, whatever solutions we pursue, they have to be pursued together and that our being together is, is an antidote to the isolation. And so I leave you with um, the second half of one of the opening words 
from our hymnal number 434 by Anonymous. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to each other. So my name's Jake Morrill. I'm uh, a minister in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, a town of 29,000 outside Knoxville. Uh, this morning, waking up and hearing the news about the uh, officers uh, killed in Dallas, I um, got up and went to the grocery store and got some flowers and a card, and I went to the local hot bagel place and got a tray of comfort food and brought that to the police department. Um, and I was thinking about the uh, officers who um, understand themselves to be in harm's way uh, on my behalf and the behalf of my family every day. And I also know that Hot Bagel is where all of the people who watch Fox News gather every morning. And I made sure to let those two tables know exactly what I was doing because they know who I am and they've got their opinions about me. So I asked them to help me pick out what bagels would be good to take to the police officers. And... Um, I've spent the rest of the day in meetings with community leaders, listening to people with African American kids talk about, um, you know, what it is to um, to feel that fear. And this has been the conversations in the last couple of days. Uh, and I guess my effort in all of this is to try to see in my context what could bring about better conditions, a better ecosystem for all, but especially those who are on the margins, and especially in these times, uh, black lives. And I know that in our muddled way over the last 18 months or so, you know, these processes have borne fruit. The boys club that was going to shut down youth activities for African-American teenagers primarily is staying open. Uh, we've got better tracking for um, traffic stops, a good policy for that in town now. And we've gotten new statistics that are more transparent, more statistics out about, you know, the schools uh, and, and the disparity rate and discipline and academics. And it's also slow work. You know, it's, um, it's today there was no rally to go to. There was no street to join in on in the town where I live. There's no Black Lives Matter movement here. I could have gone out by myself and stood on the turnpike. Um, and, you know, I know among us that there are folks who are calling for revolution and, and I don't know if I'm doing the right thing or if I'm just feeding officers who are fueling the problems. But uh, I guess I, I just know that I've been trying to be a pastor and I've been trying to hold out in, before me the dream of the beloved community and I guess I believe, you know, I've heard that um, in the civil rights movement, there was Malcolm on the prophetic edge and Martin at the negotiating table and Whitney Young at the Urban League and Fannie Lou Hamer organizing, Bayard Rustin strategizing and Nina Simone singing to wake up people's hearts. And, you know, I'm trying to find my place in that. Uh, and um, Chris Morrell from Chicago. Oh, I hear somebody's voice. But anyway, that's probably a, a sign from beyond that, I, that I've rambled long enough. Anyway, um, I'm exhausted. I know a lot of you all are too. I'm unsure. I know a lot of you all are too. I'm trying to find the, the next move forward and not sure what it is. So here in heartbreak with a lot of you all. And I guess uh, Kathy Schmitz is up next. Thanks, Jake. It's good to be with everyone. 
uh, I'm here in Orlando and have so appreciated the outpouring of love and support from the entire Unitarian Universalist community and world over the last month as we've dealt with our particular manifestation of violence and hatred here. I want to lift up what has been so important for me in Orlando in the last month, and that is that when faced with violence and theologies of division and hatred, our community has, has come together, that we've really been united. This week, I was at an interfaith luncheon that I attend every month, and we were talking about it. I've only been here in Orlando for six years, but we we're talking about how impressive, really, and and such a um, tending of the heart in the midst of of trauma. Um, the the leadership, the the response of community leaders has been. Several people who've been around much longer than I have here in Orlando said this isn't an accident. There's been a concerted effort in the community over the last 10 years to build community so that we are a resilient community. This isn't an accident that we are finding unity in this response. The Someone else said, you know, it's different than when we were here at 9-11 because we aren't meeting each other for the first time. We already know each other. And so this work of building community has to be done well in the advance of a crisis. And we, it feels like a national crisis right now, but there's still time to reach out in each of our individual communities in our heartbreak and establish those relationships. If I've learned a lesson in nothing else in the last month, it's been the reality of intersectionality for us refusing to to marginalize any of the affected communities, the GLBTQ community, the Latinx community, or the Muslim community, which unfortunately has seen tremendous backlash in our area. All of these go together. We Right now here, we're very um, enamored of our first response, responders, the police and the medical teams that worked so hard. But over the last year, We've had community conversations with our police department that they've been going into the communities of been forums organized by the Peace and Justice Initiative of the local college. We are finding our unity not in a vacuum, but in a concerted, committed effort to be united. And so I, in the midst of anger and pain and despair, because that's, you know, so much of that this week, um, find my place of hope in the possibility that by being in relationship, by refusing to be isolated, as was mentioned, by, by looking at each other in the eye and finding our common humanity, we will get through this. But we have a long road ahead. But my, my confidence, and my hope and my faith is that we will do it together. I thank you. I'm Susan Newman Moore. I'm the acting senior minister of All Souls Church in Washington, DC. And Today was the first day I cried after all of the violence this week. Unexpectedly, it just came up my heart and I decided that I wanted to pray a prayer that was written by Dr. Martin Luther King when he was pastoring Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. This man whose vision was the beloved community and all that he's gone through, all the violence, the bombing of the church, the little girls, the dogs, the hoses, the beatings, the lynchings. If he could pray this prayer in the midst of all of that, I feel that it would help us. 
This is Dr. King's prayer. O oh God, we are thankful for the golden privilege to worship. We are grateful that thou hast kept us through the long night of the past and ushered us into the challenge of the present and the bright hope of our future. Help us never to let anyone or any condition pull us so low as to cause us to hate. Give us the strength to love our enemies and to do good to those who despitefully use us and persecute us. We thank thee for thy church, founded upon thy word that challenges us to do more than sing and pray, but go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depended on us and not upon thee. And then finally, help us to realize that humankind was created to shine like the stars and live on through eternity. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together, pray together, sing together, and live together until that day when all God's children, black, white, red, and yellow, will rejoice in one common band of humanity. In thy kingdom we pray. Amen and amen. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Horan, and I am the executive director of Moose Jaw, the Minnesota Unitarian Universalist Social Justice Alliance, uh, and I live here in Minneapolis. Um, I came uh, directly to my kitchen table here where I'm talking to you from, uh, from the protests, the in small encampment that has been happening outside of um, Minnesota Governor Dayton's uh, residence since the shooting of um, Philando the other day here in Minneapolis, which I know many of you have read about. Um, Philando Castile, 32-year-old uh, black man here in the Twin Cities. Um, I went there before I came here um, after spending most of the day yesterday there uh, because to me, and I think to so many people, these sites of protest are as much about what they do for the community that engages in that protest and in the community building that happens there as they are about changing the public um, perception or about forcing and pressuring change. Um, I want to share a couple of photos, if it's okay with you, um, from this afternoon uh, of the the is sort of gathering that was happening there, the encampment. So I'm gonna try and share my screen here and I think that should work. Bob is signaling me that it should. Um, and let's try it this way. Here we go. Um, so this is right in front of the governor's office or the governor's mansion. Um, you'll see that there's just, it's a Friday afternoon, folks are there. There's probably, when I got there this afternoon, maybe 50 people or 75 people. Um, <clears throat> various members of the community were just taking the mic and speaking. Um, a lot of people just speaking about their own experiences of um, grief and trauma. Uh, Mike was held almost exclusively by black folks from the community. Um, and you can see that folks have decorated the fence here more shots of folks kind of standing around and being together. This is, um, pardon some of the profanity that's on here, but it is also beautifully real and important, I think. This is a, um, a chalkboard set up by the Million Artist Movement here to invite people to share their thoughts, have them witnessed, make them public, and have them not, lit quite literally, not be erased. Um, and you can see that folks have been adding to that. I think it's a place of resistance and healing and also beauty that's happening. Um, I keep commenting to folks that one of the things that is driving me um, absolutely bananas and also making me incredibly deeply grateful is that um, 
since our community responded to the killing of Jamar Clark by police in Minneapolis in November, um, we got really good at doing this, at doing long-term protest and resistance, um, at, and listening to the leadership of um, largely young, largely queer Black folks and Black and Brown folks. Um, and we figured out early on that we needed to be hydrated and well-fed in order to sustain this movement. And so almost immediately um, after Philando Castile was killed, uh, people started bringing down resources. They brought water and food, just knowing that something was going to happen. It was going to go on for a while and people needed to be resourced. So you can see the piles of water that were brought. There's a few tables that are set up with food and um, there was a sign on one of these piles of water yesterday that said our real thirst is for justice which i thought was beautiful more conversation happening here there's also a sidewalk chalk project one of our local um, uh, organizations that minnesota trans health coalition sent a huge pile of sidewalk chalk down um, encouraging people to to write messages of resistance and hope and fear and disgust and anger. And they're everywhere. And this one, if you can read it, says, I no longer accept what I can't change. I change what I can't accept. It's Angela Davis. More messages on the sidewalk there, view from the governor's office. This one says, we are not free. And the sign says, am I next? This is one of the food tables um, where folks have just been piling snacks all day. People setting up a little altar here uh, that burned through the night, a little prayer space. So there we are. Um, I share those images with you to, um, first of all, humanize sort of what gets sensationalized on the national news when you hear reported of what's happening here and in other places. Um, I also share it because for me, um, you know, it was going to church this afternoon to go and be with people, to hear people um, <coughs> speaking truth, speaking hard words, speaking angry words, um, and to listen to those, to be around those and not feel like I had to explain it to anybody. I wasn't in charge of anything. I wasn't in charge of processing or making meaning out of things. And it was a privilege to be with folks in that um, community space and um, one of the beautiful things that comes out of, of um, protest movements of justice movements and of movement building is that um, communities discover not only how to point that energy outward into the world to force change and create pressure and agitate but how to use those spaces that are simultaneously creating that pressure to be healing and um, providing resiliency and a wellspring of connection and deep sense of not being alone. Um, and I hope that those spaces exist in uh, many, many, many of the places that you live too. Um, and that if you have the privilege to be a part of them, that you are, that you take advantage of that. Um, and I send out prayers for people all over the country who are doing protests who are working not just on the streets, but in a thousand different places um, to create spaces where resistance and resiliency are the culture and the norm and not the exception. Hi, everyone. My name is Reverend Abby Tennis. I serve as Minister for Worship and Pastoral Care of the First Unitarian Church of Oakland out here in Oakland, California right now. And in a couple of weeks, I'll be heading over um, to serve as the minister at the First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia. I want to share with you a um, Muslim prayer that is called Al Ikhlas. It's the um, 111, sorry, it's the 112th surah of the Holy Quran. This prayer was taught to me by my Sufi Sheikh and my teacher and mentor, Dr. Ibrahim Farjaje, who served as the professor as a professor and as the provost of Star King School for the Ministry for many years. Dr. Farajaje passed away this past year, and um, this is one of the prayers we shared at his memorial services. Um, it's a prayer that 
is considered to be um, so spiritually powerful that if you pray it three times, um, it's equivalent to praying the entire Quran, to reciting the entire Quran. As we struggle to cope with the violence tearing apart our world, tearing apart communities of color, may we each find refuge in infinite mercy. May we do all that we can in the name of tender compassion. The English translation or similar, the message in English is, I take refuge with Allah, the all merciful from the source of all negativity. In the name of Allah, the tenderly compassionate and infinitely merciful one, Say Allah is the one. Allah is the uncaused cause of all that exists. Allah does not give birth and nothing gave birth to Allah and there is none like unto Allah. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. A'udhu billahi minash shaitani rajeem Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad. Lam Yalid, wa Lam Yulad, wa Lam Yakulahu, Kufu Anad. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Kulu Allahu Ahad. Allahu Samad. Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad wa Lam Yakulahu. Kufu Anad. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Kulu Allahu Ahad. Allahu Samad. Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad wa Lam Yakulahu. Kufu Ahad. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. May we pray for all those lives that have been lost and for those still living. May we find refuge in infinite mercy. May all that we do be in the name of infinite compassion. Amen, amin, ashe, and blessed be. This is to Queen of Boston, and I am grateful for the presence of all who have shared and all who are in this vigil time, this sacred time. Meg asked me to speak to racist violence and to the strength of the ancestors. And it is in the refuge of poetic ancestors uh, that I find strength and solace. And I found a poem from a book, which the name of it will tell you its age. It's called American Negro Poetry, an anthology edited by Arna Bontemps. And this poem is Dark Symphony by Melvin B. Tolson. Um, and it was actually published in 1944, but I think it speaks very much to today. Black Christmas addicts taught us how to die before white Patrick Henry's bugle breath uttered the vertical transmitting cry, yea, give me liberty or give me death. And from that day to this, men and women, black and strong, for justice and democracy have stood, steeled in the faith that right will conquer wrong, and time will usher in one brotherhood. No Banquo's ghost can rise against us now and say we crushed men with a tyrant's boot or press the crown of thorns on labor's brow or ravaged lands and carted off the loot. The centuries-old pathos in our voices saddens the great white world. 
and the wizardry of our dusky rhythms conjures up shadow shapes of antebellum years. Black slaves singing one more river to cross in the torture tombs of slave ships. Black slaves singing steal away to Jesus in jungle swamps. Black slaves singing the crucifixion in slave pens at midnight. Black slaves singing swing low sweet chariot in cabins of death. Black slaves singing go down Moses in the cane breaks of the southern pharaohs. They tell us to forget the Golgotha we tread, we who are scourged with hate, a price upon our head. They who have shackled us require of us a song. They who have wasted us bid us or look the wrong. They tell us to forget democracy is spurned. They tell us to forget the bill of rights is burned. 300 years we slaved, we slave and suffer, yet though flesh and bone rebel, they tell us to forget. Oh, how can we forget our human rights denied? Oh, how can we forget our humanity crucified? When justice is profaned and plea with curse is met? When freedom's gates are barred, oh, how can we forget? None in the land can say to us today, you send the tractors on their bloody path and create okies for the grapes of wrath. You breed the slum that breeds a native son to damn the good earth pilgrim fathers one. None in the land can say to us today, you dupe the poor with rags to riches tails and leave the workers empty dinner pails. You stuff the ballot box, and honest men are muzzled by your demagogic den. None in the land can say to us today, you smash stock markets with your coin blitzkriegs and make a hundred million guinea pigs. You counterfeit our Christianity and bring contempt upon democracy. None in the land can say to us today, you prowl when citizens are fast asleep and hatch fifth column plots to blast the deep. Foundations of the state and leave the land a vast Sahara with a fascist brand. None in the land can say to us today, you send flame gutting tanks like swarms of flies and plump a hell from dynamiting skies. You fill machine gun towns with rotting dead, a no man's land where children cry for bread. Out of abysses of illiteracy, through labyrinths of lies, across wastelands of disease, we advance. Out of dead ends of poverty, through wildernesses of superstition, across barricades of Jim Crowism, we advance. With the peoples of the world, we advance. My name is uh, Nathan, I'm one of the ministers in Baton Rouge. Um, we're the second blackest state in the country. So a little about uh, the city of Baton Rouge. It is um, split right in half. Um, the north half of Baton Rouge is predominantly black. The south half is predominantly white. The south half has LSU, which is a predominantly white institution. The north half has, half has southern which is a uh, HBCU. Within the past five years, North Baton Rouge has seen two hospitals close. They have no emergency room. Uh, their schools have closed. They have no access to grocery stores. Uh, they don't see infrastructure in the way that the white part of the town does. Uh, but, you know, Louisiana is filled with people um, who have felt shame and guilt for generations because of how tumultuous the river is here and how dangerous the river is. What the people I serve don't always understand is that the river is so big and dangerous here because it carries the nation. 
which you should also know about Baton Rouge or Louisiana in general. In the 60s, when Alabama wouldn't let black people march to the Capitol, the governor of Louisiana said, you better let black people march to our Capitol, and they did. In the 50s, we did a bus boycott in Baton Rouge, and Martin Luther King came and studied it for the Montgomery boycott. We have a program here started by one member of the church and one member of the community called Dialogues on Race. Probably 10,000 people in Baton Rouge have had interracial dialogues for maybe 15 years because of that. Right after Alton Sterling was killed, there was a vigil at the place he died. The next day, the governor handed over the investigation to the feds, and then immediately he met with a group of interfaith, interracial clergy um, who have been doing great work in Louisiana. Wednesday night, they had a vigil. Um, there were hundreds of people there, and it's hot in Baton Rouge. Um, with 100% humidity, it was probably 105 degree heat index. And people stood out in the heat for two or three hours um, while speakers were talking and people were praying. Um, Alton Sterling's brother painted a picture of him on the convenience store where he was killed. After the sun went down, um, a brass band showed up and people danced. One of the people who spoke at that rally was Victor White Sr. His son, two years earlier in New Iberia, was shot and killed by police. Well, he was handcuffed and put in the back of a police car and found shot in the chest with a shotgun. And the Department of Justice agreed with the coroner that it was probably a suicide. Uh, his family didn't get justice. This is the first time that I know of that a black person in Louisiana was killed and the nation paid attention. If I am this affected and I'm like the eighth or ninth circle out of impact on this, I don't know what the families in my church who are worried about their kids going on the street feel like. I have hope because I've seen the resilience of the state and these people and I've seen the resilience of the church I serve. I see hope in the fact that people notice finally. Thank you for organizing this. Hauser, um, I'm currently serving as the Director of Religious Education at East Shore Unitarian Church in Bellevue. Uh, but right now I am actually in Washington, D.C. visiting my mother, who uh, was born about three hours from Cairo, e Egypt, in Egypt, and I was born in Alexandria. And um, we just arrived this morning. We took a 6 a.m. flight from Maine. Um, and she has Al Jazeera on television watching, and, and they had the news in Arabic of what was going on in Dallas. So it was quite a surreal moment because I had already seen the CNN English version. And so as we're watching Al Jazeera, she turned to me, and she hadn't heard about what happened yet in Dallas, and she said in Arabic, you know it's the white people. It's the, you can't bring people in chains and do this for hundreds of years and not expect this to happen. She said the white people, they took everything, their religion, and they put them in chains, and you can't. And she's saying this to me in Arabic, not knowing that I'll be taking part in a vigil, and I'm just looking at her, and, and um, I have a strong sense of social justice from my mother. and. Um, she would say, there's a phrase in Arabic, um, for that bit nina, She'd say, like, God, around our necks are the poor and the people who need us, and we can't see injustice and not respond. 
um, it's been a surreal week. Uh, not only am I visiting my mother, who um, I didn't think I would see very often in my life because my husband's Jewish and she's Muslim, um, and my husband's in law enforcement. So he's a law enforcement officer, and I'm a UU, and I stand for Black Lives Matter. And um, I've kind of been just been feeling nauseous the last few days because my husband has carried a gun for the last 18 years, even when we fly, which is very strange. Um, and probably one of the best things I did at General Assembly, I did a lot of great things, is buy a book called Cultivating Empathy by Nate Walker. And it's probably, for me, been the most perfect um, thing to read because I just haven't known what to do. And I just want to read a paragraph. When we fail to see one another's humanity, we cannot use our imagination responsibly. We are incapable of using our moral imagination when we are not able to understand what it means, what it must be like to see the world through another person's eyes. Failing in this, we fail to cultivate empathy and compassion, and our imagination becomes imprisoned by discriminatory thoughts. Nate, goes, Nate Walker wrote the book, and he goes on to talk about othering. And he said, Other, otherness is a root of violence. We can and must reflect upon this truth. Violent cycles begin when fear and bigotry plague the imagination. But with insight, the mind can use the moral imagination as an ethical discipline to transform any conflict. When used mindfully, this everyday practice can evoke empathy and compassion in oneself and in another. Not knowing what else to do, I'm holding on to these words. I so great, I'm so grateful for this space. Um, Abby, I will show my mother that you sang in Arabic. Um, she will be so thrilled and touched and moved. And um, thank you all. Ashe, amen, and uh, blessed be. I'm Daniel Cantor, I'm one of the ministers in Dallas, Texas. And I think we need to start, I need to start by naming the, the dead. <clears throat> they are Lorne Ahrens, Michael Kroll, Michael Smith. Brent Thompson, Patrick Zamaripa, and Micah Johnson. Micah Johnson was the shooter in the event in my city. I was not at the protest, but some of my members were and some of my friends were. I couldn't be there. Um, but I got home just in time to turn on the news and see uh, my city in a um, in a mess, and we are trying to figure out what that feels like to have a city that is, as you look in your TV, says uh, there was an ambush. There's militarized language. There's all kinds of thoughts about what this was. We live in a place that is. Um, armed and today at the the prayer service with the mayor and the police chief and 60 or 50 or 60 clergy they gave us these ribbons and we wore them today as we stood together with about a thousand people in Dallas one of the important things that the police chief said was, thank you. That we could come together in this uh, moment, very difficult moment. It's a, the situation really is a situation of a lot of contradictions. Um, we had a, a peaceful Black Lives Matter event erupted into an ambush on police. We had members of that protest walking around with empty 
AR-15s as a show of power. We had snipers shooting people from perches at the tops of buildings, reminiscent of the great scar on Dallas from the Kennedy assassination. We had the shooter who was a black man and a veteran who was killed by a machine by police so that he wouldn't kill more people. So we're trying to make sense of, of all this. Um, today we, we mourn for the whole country and we prayed together numerous times with um, peop- members of, of the clergy in the city saying things like, we are going to heal this. We are going to join together and we take a pledge not to step back from holding those accountable who commit violence, whether they're on the side of law enforcement or whether they're not. And today is really for Dallas a day of, of grieving and prayer. And I find myself um, with every kind message that comes in from you colleagues and friends uh, feeling more weepy and more sad for not only my city that feels uh, like it had been moving from a city of hate to a city of love and unity uh, and now has been knocked back some, but also for all these events that we see especially the loss of black men in what's very uh, a common moment, uh, driving down the road or being stopped by a police. And as Rob said, this is not isolated, but we have to stop. And I don't have many more words this moment. Um, my people who were at the, the vigil, I believe, are, are okay. I've heard from some of them. Uh, many of them were locked down in the city uh, for many hours. Uh, one friend of mine who's a black, pa- black Baptist pastor in the south side of Dallas said they were locked in a restaurant for hours last night. But he said... He wanted us to remember that it was a beautiful night. Not only was the heat relieved a little bit by the the wind and the breeze, but it was also a beautifully peaceful night. And that shattering is not uncommon to so many, but it has come to our city uh, today, and we are grieving. I turned my camera on and not my mic. I apologize. Um, My name is Mandy Goheen. I'm part of the staff at the Church of the Larger Fellowship and the Director of Prison Ministry. And this week has been a lot about talking to these kids sitting behind me about what's going on. And um, it's interesting that Abby called forth um, a dear teacher, Ibrahim, because the best lesson I ever learned from him was that my children are really the teachers, not me. Um, So I am inviting us all into a space of prayer for the children of the people who died this week. Spirit of love and life, surround Cameron Sterling. May your tears leak into the hardened hearts of those who would say our children are our future. Beautiful child in the back seat, you not, do not belong to us, we belong to you. And we have damaged you with terror. You are not the first or the only person with a heart to comfort your mother that we have disregarded and thrown away with violence. Forgive us, forgive me, 
my teachers. This world is yours, not mine. You have the weight of the world on your shoulders, and adults seem to find you invisible. And if your brown skin shows, then you're seen as a target and killed. Forgive us, my teachers. Forgive us, my teachers in Baghdad, my teachers in Orlando, my teachers in Minnesota, Louisiana, Iraq, Palestine, Columbus, every city, Montgomery, Alabama, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Chicago, D.C., every place where your bodies are thrown away or not seen. Systemic violence is silencing our teachers with privilege of adult whiteness. Dear black children, you are not ours. We are yours, and we ask your forgiveness, and we pray for you, and we will continue to help you hold the future because it belongs to you. We do not need to wait for you to save us. And for the parents of all who are hurting from the loss of children, I also hold them in my heart and pray for them that they may find some peace and love in the world again. Forgive us children, forgive us parents. Forgive us for silencing our teachers. Fill us with the courage and the Holy Spirit to step forward into the fight and not be afraid because of the mistakes that we've asked to be forgiven for. May it be so, and amen. Amen, and amen. Thank you for being here. If you have lit a chalice or a candle, I invite you to extinguish it. We extinguish the flame that we've lit for this hour, but not the flame that burns eternal the flame of love, the flame of our commitment to a just and caring world. We've heard from some beloved people, known and unknown all around, and there are many more stories to tell. I encourage everybody to be kind to one another, to be kind to yourself, and to tell your story. We'll have a closing song as people go. Thank you so much for joining us.